Hello everyone, welcome back to another FL Studio tutorial. Today we're going to be going over how to make a gritty drum and bass. Now of course my tutorial is in FL, but this does apply to every DAW. But before I do go about anything explanation wise, we're going to go ahead and play a little bit of what we have here. So you can see what you could expect to make after this video. Okay, so that is the quick little track I've put together for this video here. And as you can see, this is mainly just drums and sort of one bass sound. So on its own to start with, it sounds like this. Okay, so let's explain how I went about making this. Very first thing we're going to do is actually quickly disable all of the effects on this so you could hear what it sounded like straight out of Vital. Now, Vital is the synth I make this with. I usually use Serum, but you could get Vital for free. So if you want to download that and kind of follow along here, feel free. But without any effects on either Vital itself or on the mixer, the bass sound sounds like this. So you can see it's close to our final result, but it's a lot less powerful. It's much quieter because it's missing a lot of compression. It's missing a, a good amount of effects that gave it space and made it take up a lot of area in the mix, which, as I say, is super important. But let's get into how I achieved everything from here. The very first thing I did when I opened Vital is I went to LFO1 and I drew this shape. Now, you don't need to make this exact shape. This is just the one I did. And if you pay attention to that as you play the bass, that's where that movement's coming from. Because the MIDI, as you can see, these notes are very flat. It's not actually jumping up like an octave, even though it sounds like it is. That's not what's happening there. This is just all done with that LFO1 automation. And I literally went to like here, for example, you see I have in harmonic chosen. You could choose different options. There's like vocode, formant scale, smear. There's a lot of cool ones. I literally just cycled through until I found one that I thought sounded interesting on my first oscillator. And I did the same thing over here. I ended up with formant and I'm just modulating these with that LFO shape. Not even doing it by too much, like you see that green line that appears when I hover over this, like that's over here. That's the amount. And if we listen to it, just on oscillator 1, and you see this is where the majority of the sound is. This is the dominant wavetable, everything else is just sort of support. But I was changing stuff with Foreman and in harmonic here, and that's kind of how I got the initial sound. It's just trial and error. You can expect to get something completely different using a different wavetable. And you can also change the tone of it by editing this here, which I'll explain later, because that's how I got hear that variation. That's a different instance of this patch. I actually cloned it. So from here, the second thing I added was dedicated sub. I didn't want my sub to be unstable. I wanted it nice, strong, and stable. And you could probably barely hear that right now, because one, it's super quiet, and two, it's pretty much just a sine wave. So especially if you're listening on, say, phone speakers, that's going to be almost inaudible, I bet. And then the third one, just for some stereo, this one actually has seven voices of unison. This was just a stereo with layer. But as I say, all of this right now is very quiet because we took off the post-processing. So what I did under effects, again, this just like everything else, was simply trial and error. First off, I did some hard clip distortion, just to go ahead and give it a lot of grit. I'll actually compare that one by one as I add them. So that made it louder off the jump, you can notice. But then I have this filter that I'm editing here. This isn't doing too much. This is just getting rid of a lot of super high tops whenever that's not up in this shape. And then I have chorus for extra stereo width. I made sure to get rid of the lows from here so that way it's not giving it like a lot of mud. Then I'm doing some flanger automation and then lastly a phaser. They're all following the same shape. You see, I don't have an LFO2 doing anything. It's all a very simple sound just done with LFO1. So that is the in-vital effects that I used for the sound. And then, of course, we do have my actual mixer, which beefs this up quite a bit. If we take a look one by one what's happening, first we do have gain reduction. This is a great compressor. I really like it. It makes things huge right away. And following that, I did some saturation. 
I divided this up into bands. This is all very important, by the way. You'll notice if I do like a before and after, this makes a huge difference. First off, I was just doing some clean tube saturation on everything below 130-ish. This is just kind of affecting my sine wave. I removed a bit of mud from this region between, say, 130 and 300-ish. And then throughout like my mids and highs, I'm just doing a lot of warm tape saturation to really beef up this sound. Following that, I have a multiband compressor to try to make everything a bit more balanced and even. And of course, I don't recommend you just go and copy the settings I used here, because this setting is specifically like for my sound, and it made my sound sound good. But if you're making a different sound, this is all going to change quite a bit. Following that, I do have an EQ. I thought the sound was a bit dark at this stage. So first off, I rolled off any stereo uh, below 150 hertz or so, and I just did a dynamic boost around here, and then rolled off some tops. Then I have another Fab Filter Saturn 2, that was just for crushing the entire thing single band. And then I just did some Soothe and we have a bit of reverb as well, which is being modulated. That was mainly for the build up because you see when I have this section down here, it's very dark because this is meant to be the build up section of the track. But as I say, those effects make a world of difference. You know, we turn them off and then turn them on. That's what got us nice and loud here. And you see, this is sitting right at zero. If you remember my mastering video, I talked about how typically the way I go about getting loud masters is I take the section of my track that is the loudest, which of course would be this, and I try to make sure all of the elements together instrumental-wise, so like every instrument not counting drums and stuff, is sitting right around zero. Because this is the only one, that's exactly where it's sitting. So I had that play for a little bit, and then I realized, you know, for the second section of this drop, we need some variation. So literally, all I did, I right-clicked on Vital, and I hit Clone. Made a new instance of that same patch, which goes to our pattern 3 here. And all I did in here was move the wavetable position, and literally just turned some knobs a bit to give it a slightly different tone. So you see, if we compare it, the first one we got. And then over here. It's like a little deeper. I think this is the coolest part of the whole track. I think this is the best bass sound in the whole thing. And we do have another variation for the end of it. It was literally just me cloning it and changing things to give it variation. I think that's crucial to this because if we had that sit the whole way through just as one, it would have gotten incredibly boring. But I hope that's a bit of insight as to how I went about making that sound because it's not too complicated, but it's just something you get with experience. If I opened a new project and was like, all right, I want to try to make that sound again, I probably couldn't. It was just random with me going through different wavetables and modulating things that I thought just sounded good at the time. But that's the general way I go about making heavy bass stuff for gritty drum and bass. The only thing left to really talk about here in this track is the drums and how I mix those. This is extremely similar to how I did my mastering tutorial. I think I even used the same project for the short. As I say, you mix the loudest element to zero, and then I also recommend you mix your kick and snare to hitting right around zero as well. So if we turn off everything else, just so you could hear that, you see my kick and snare right here. They're hitting zero each. And then of course you mix the rest of the drum hits like top loops, ghost snares, whatever to taste. And then the very last thing I wanna bring up is side chaining. When you're making this type of drum and bass, you're going to have obviously a super bassy lead element like this. And that is going to eat up a lot of space and conflict with your kick drum. So when you're doing stuff like this and you want it to get loud, you absolutely need to be side chaining. You see, I have my kick rooted to a sidechain bus, and I'm doing it with Pro-MB. I'm doing my lows and mids and highs separate. So that's just this. I have an in-depth video on how to set this up, which I highly recommend you check out. But of course, if you're not sidechaining, you're going to get a lot of distortion. I can actually demonstrate that here. You see, the kick and snare are just getting eaten up by everything else, and they don't punch through, and it makes it sound bad. You simply turn those on. Now you can clearly hear them and there's good space for them. I hope this has explained things a little bit. I thought this was actually the perfect project file to make a video like this on because there's really only one central element and I wanted to explain like my thoughts on post-processing, how to make that wide and big and sound good. I hope this has answered your questions, but if you have any others, please let me know in the comments below. 
If this video helped you out, drop a like on it and subscribe for more music production content in the future. And of course, I will see you in the next video.